Has God been good to anybody this morning? Hallelujah. Let's jump straight into God's word. I got a phone call from someone from Leo that wanted to know what time we're finished because you have to have brunch right after. So I said, Lord, let me keep it short this morning. I don't want anybody here and their mind on the food. Amen. So I'm going to give you a nice short little message this morning. Lest your mind wander and you're here in body, but your mind is somewhere else. Amen. <laughs> it's all right to smile. It's all right to laugh, to sing, because God has been good to all of us. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Kings and chapter 14. We're going to be looking this morning at a short story from the Bible. I'm not sure how many people here this morning may be familiar with this story. I'll be honest with you, it's not a story that I am well read in. Um, seeking the Lord this week for a message, this passage came to me, a bit of a piece of it. And um, I find it truly fascinating. And I pray that as we look at it this morning, somebody will be blessed and uh, challenged. So let's jump right into it. First Kings chapter 14 and verse 1. It begins, At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. As we draw the curtains of this story this morning, it begins with a scene of sickness. We look at this story this morning, a man, a young man by the name of Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. The Bible does not say to us how he became sick. It does not say to us how long he was sick. It didn't say perhaps it began with a cough, a little pain, a, a little discomfort. It never said to us anything about the sickness. But as the story and the verse opens up, it just simply said that he was sick. Let me challenge you this morning. I, anybody like being sick this morning? Is there anyone among us that just loves to be sick? <laughs> I didn't think so. Do I see a hand at the back? No, somebody's scratching their nose. All right, I just want to make sure. <laughs> no one likes to be sick. And uh, I personally hate being sick. And uh, the pain the weakness, the disturbance of my ever-packed schedule, the powerlessness. Sick is not good. But as this story opens up, I find there's something in it that's even worse than sickness. It is a, a sick child. Now, uh, God has been good to me. I have two children, and for those of you who are who have, don't have children yet, you may not have any idea what I'm talking about yet. But there is something special about a sick child. And all the parents said, Amen. Amen. I don't know, some, some of the, the young people that don't have any children like looking at me like, what are you talking about? But as the little pig said to the mommy pig, Mommy, why are you know so long? Mommy, in her wisdom, just said to the little pig, just wait. And I remember my first child, my daughter. I remember... <laughs> Let me see hands of all the parents in the house. What an adventure parenting is. Amen? I remember our first child, we were going to the supermarket, and my wife buying baby water. Have you ever seen girl about water? I'm saying, honey, where do you go? She said, no, 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 the baby needs special water. One lady said to me, her first child, she remember taking warm water and sterilizing the washing machine. She wanted to make sure there were no germs on her first baby's clothes. She laughed and said to me, the last child is a miracle that one lives. Because I threw 
put the clothes in with my clothes and wash everything together. Amen. <laughs> but the first one, you know, that novelty of a new child. Amen. But then, amidst the first, there's also the first time your child is sick. And I'll tell you from experience, it's a horrible feeling to see your child sick, the child that you love, and it does something to you on the inside to see your child sick. And this story opens up this morning with a sick child. And uh, there is something about our children I find that all of us love. Whatever it is, the bad man, the gun man, the mobster, there is something about our children that I find that we love. Anybody here love their children? Messed up, rebellious, own we, but you love your children. Amen? And when that child is sick, it touches you on the inside. And this story opens up with a common thread that we all face, which is sickness. Something that, that none of us like something that we would rather not, but something that is common to us all. As we look at the background of Jeroboam this morning, who was Abijah's father, um, I did a little research on Jeroboam, and uh, he was actually a king. He was a king of the northern Israelite kingdom of Israel. He had great wealth. He wielded great power. But his son was sick. I just want to remind you this morning, church, that despite our power, prestige, skills on the basketball court, knowledge, um, I can imagine we have many educated people here with us this morning. I want to tell you this morning, there are some situations for which wealth and power, affluence, connections, networking cannot help. And this wealthy, powerful king found himself in a situation where his child was sick. There are situations for which we cannot just write a check and solve the problem. There are situations that even if the prime minister is your friend and you have him on speed, speed dial on your phone, by calling him, he, he cannot help you either. There are situations in life, no matter how great your insurance plan, no matter how well connected you are, there are some things in life that will hit us for which there is no preparation, there is no help that brings us many times, or reminds us rather, of how fragile we are. I believe when I read this story that Jeroboam loved his son. I believe as I read this story that Jeroboam got the best doctors possible. Jeroboam sent for the specialists in whatever field this sickness was. You will... Do you believe that with me this morning, Jeroboam went all out for his child? Wouldn't you go all out for your child? Don't you go all out for your child? Many parents this week may be eating bread and cheese because their children's school fee was paid, should have been paid this week. Amen? And truly, we will give everything we have that our children are taken care of, correct? Yes. We will do it out for them. And I can imagine Jeroboam, loving his child, would have sought after the best doctors. Best doctors, physicians, and sadly, having sought all the best doctors, the situation didn't grow better, but the sickness grew worse. You know, sometimes when you're desperate, and this is a passing note when I read this story. I thought, I believe Jeroboam tried all kind of bush too. Hmm? You see, what happens is, right, when you're sick, 
and or someone near and dear to you is sick and you've tried so many remedies and nothing seems to be working you will try anything hmm? so if somebody tell you um boil green banana leaf you will claim the, the <laughs> any tree to get that leaf to boil it because you want your child to be well. Amen? And I believe, though the Bible does not say that Jeroboam went all out for his child. He spared no expense. He did everything. He tried little granny's recipe. I remember a friend of mine, a doctor, an African, she said, you people in Antigua, everything for you is gas. Every problem is gas. Somebody come with pain? Oh, I have gas. <laughs> you know, the medical profession is not all about gas. <laughs> but truly, when we're sick, when our child is sick, I believe Jer Jeroboam went all out. He tried everything. But he tried everything. He worked with the best specialists, the latest advancements. But nothing seemed to work. I want to challenge you this morning, and I, I, I heard it being said by a man of God many years ago, that a man can spend his whole life amassing a fortune, get sick, and what took him 50 years to make, he will spend it in five months. He will f fly to Australia if he believes. The Bible says, all that a man has, that will he give for his life. And this story begins very sober. It begins with a father trying to help his sick son. I don't know, it's just my speculation, I don't know if Abijah was in constant pain. I don't know if he was bedridden. Um, I, I, I put in my notes as I prepared this message that I pray that none of us ever knows firsthand what Jeroboam went through. I pray that none of us ever have to come to a point. Do you know this morning how blessed we are? Now, I'm saying that your bank account may not be six figures. Your, your bank account may not even have six dollars. But I want to tell you that if you're alive, you're healthy, you're here, you're in your right mind, you have so much to thank God for. Amen? And your children may not be... I remember God convicted me a day. We, we, we took a little vacation, and um, a little staycation, and uh, my children are energetic to say the least and sometimes it takes so much out of me up and down climb up run up and down as my mother would tell us when we were young no i come home everybody have to hear my mouth hmm? they're so energetic and sometimes it takes something from me and all the honest parents said amen <laughs> and uh, sometimes it gets to you but I remember just recently we were at the, at the hotel and I saw a friend of mine went up. I said, how are you doing? Long time. What's up? And he says, well, my family works here and um, in the department that deals with reservation. And she's always telling me to come. But he says, I have a special needs child. And uh, to take care of that child is a full-time job. And I said, I said, I never knew that. And he said, yes. He said, the child is nine years old and the child doesn't speak. And instantly, I, I just felt very grateful to God. I said, Lord, my children are noisy, but thank God for the fact that they're noisy. Thank you, Lord, that something, they talk too much, but they can talk. Amen? And I really do believe that in this nation of Antigua and Barbuda, we're so blessed, and we ought to constantly remind ourselves of how blessed we are. For Though Jeroboam was rich, wealthy, powerful, he yielded power over ten tribes, powerful, his son was home, sick. And in this story, I believe it came, I don't know if it started with a little pain, a little cough, something happened, and then, okay, um, the first few days pass, and you expect it's going to get better, but then it gets a little worse. And then you 
The doctor comes, give you some medicine. I said, in three days, you're going to see a turnaround. And he said, okay, sure. And three days come now, and he's still getting worse. And I don't know at what point the reality, the scary reality struck home, though it be days or weeks after, that he might not make it out of this sickness. This journey that we call life has so much uncertainty in it. Here today, strong today, gone today. Amen? I have a co-worker that works down uh, in the craft market with me. I remember going to buy some chicken um, right by the side of the road there four weeks ago, I think, Saturday. And she just, and the lady says to me, do you know that this guy died? And for about two seconds, I couldn't catch myself because I just saw him working a few doors from me maybe two weeks before. Here today. Church, I want to challenge you know, one of the worst things we can be in life is proud. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And things can change so suddenly. I believe this young man, his father gave him the best schooling, best education, and everybody would say, hey, um, he has, as we would say in Antigua, in Antigua, his bread buttered. Of course, your father, the king, wealth. When, when other kids playing with toy horses, he had his big horse going down the road. And we say, boy, his bread butter, right? But then here comes something that unexpected, a little sickness. And all of a sudden now, his bright, great future becomes dark and unsure. And I pray by God's grace over my life and my family, over your life and your family, that we never know what it is to bury a child. You know, I don't think that parents should bury their children. But in this world of uncertainty, it does happen. Amen? And we, I don't know at what point reality set in and mommy and daddy said, hey, every medication we have tried, nothing, it is not responding and he may actually die. We don't know. But it, he came to that point. And uh, I don't know if Jer Jeroboam being king was, uh, as, would, what was a man that would go to the gym regular, have his own little private gym and, um, you know, uh, trainer, trainers, eat the best, healthy, big muscles. But I'm telling you, there's some pressures that hit you that you can't bench press. Hmm? There's some things in life that hit you, church, that your big bicep and tricep are going to um, push it off. And this situation here, I would categorize this as real pressure. The real things in life where you can't call anybody and get an answer. You can't, um, hey, Johnny, come and fix this one for me. It's not the washing machine. It's not the house. It's not the lawyer. It's not your banker. It's real pressure. And I want to challenge you, church, that in this life, there are many unexpected things that will hit us. But I believe that many times, real pressure proves who and what we are. Anybody have heard the phrase, talk is cheap? You ever heard anybody with, with, with a lot of big chat? And then pressure hit them and then buckle? Hmm? Anybody <laughs> in here buckle on the pressure? <laughs> real pressure. Not, not little light stuff, but real pressure hit you. Hmm? And you buckle. Because real pressure reveals who we are. I've heard so many people in my years walking with God talk a good talk. And when the pressure hit and I look back for them, all I see is the smoke of them turning the corner. Real pressure will hit you. And real pressure. Many times I say that we as people are like glasses of water. You know, everything nice, like one of those water commercials, a real nice clear glass of water. And it looks so good, looks beautiful and crystal clear. And then it gets a little shaking. And all of a sudden, you see some little stuff at the bottom that you couldn't see before 
just begin to rise to the top. You see, unless we get a little shake sometimes, even the juice that we drink, that you, when you buy your bottle of juice, what does it say on the bottle? Shake well. Because you can't get the good flavor from the juice until you shake it well. And likewise, we as people, if you want to really see, and that's why I, I sit back in this journey called life and observe, because when we get a good shaking, is when the true flavor come out. Hmm? And this was a real shaking. This was a real test. I, I don't know if you have business leaders in here, but even from my observation of life, I look and I say, anybody can lead when things are good. It's when you're under pressure, I, I, I want to see how a leader leads. Hmm? You see, and let me get, get, get into a little politics quick, quick. American politics, mind you. <laughs> but I remember, is it, was it George Bush, the former president that was before Obama? And I remember him being under oh, great scrutiny, criticism. Oh, you went into Iraq, you did this, you did that, you spent so much money. And I remember his approval ratings were so low when he left office. And uh, when President Obama came in, you know, everything good, no wars. They were leaving from Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, pretty much under control to somewhat and pulling out. And I thought, I even mentioned it to my wife, I said, Bush was dealt a very rough hand. They were attacked, 9-11, and as a leader, he had to do something. I said to my wife, let's see how it's very easy to criticize and say what is right when things are good, but let's see how Obama fears when he has some wars going on around him. And if you know anything about international news right now, between Russia, Syria, Iraq, I don't envy President Obama one bit. Hmm? And I encourage you, watch a little news, because we live in some very serious times. And if you had heard, um, Putin um, made some very serious uh, remarks reminding the world that he's a nuclear power. And Obama just came back and made some comments recently at a summit as well. But it's, it's, it's so easy to criticize when you're not under pressure. When everything good, economy good, everything good, everybody look good. It's in the midst of pressure that I can really determine what type of leader you are. And Jeroboam, I would encourage, I, I actually want to do a little study on Jeroboam, uh, not this morning, but Jeroboam came from a very humble beginning. God called him, established him. But on the true pressure now, as the pressure hit him of a sick child, pressure reveals. On the pressure is where we see our integrity. On the pressure, when the boss tells you, to shut your eye in a situation, you're a Christian, everything is going good, everybody loves you, until the boss says to you, just compromise, scratch off that zero, um, as maybe even as simple as, tell them I'm not here. It's in that situation you determine, do I stand up for what I believe in, or do I crumble on the compromise? The pressure. The Gethsemane. When Jesus went to the garden, Gethsemane, the word Gethsemane means pressure. Are to press. And I want to tell you, you know, amidst, amidst everything that we're doing, um, we need to begin to strengthen ourselves, get, get deep and take life a bit serious because pressure comes and pressure reveals who we are. Let's turn back to the scripture and let's see how Jeroboam handled this pressure. In 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 2, the Bible says, And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is a hijah, the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. And take with thee ten loaves, and cracknels, which is a biscuit, and a cruise of honey, and go to him, he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. So this morning, as we look at Jeroboam's response to this situation, 
I pray that we will learn <laughs> what I would say, what not to do under pressure. Jeroboam's response as the man of the house, as the big king over the area, over Israel. The Bible said, he called unto his wife and he said, arise, I pray thee, and disguise yourself. Take off the Versace and go and get a Stephen B. Shoals money. Disguise thyself. Change your appearance. Take off the expensive jewelry. Take off and dress as a common person. Disguise thyself that it may not be known, that you may not be known to be the wife of Jeroboam. And I want you to go down to Shiloh and there you're going to meet a prophet by the name of Ahijah. He had experience before. He's the one that told Jeroboam that he would have been king. And he said, and take with thee ten loaves, cracknels, and crews of honey, and go to him. And he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. I want to say this morning, and it don't, it don't make for good preaching and exhorting. But you know, sometimes God for many people is a last resort. Amen? You know, God for many people is a last, last, last resort. That when everything is good and shiny and new and happy and well, God is not even in our thoughts. And many times when we try everything and everybody and all else fails, that's when we run to God. The good news with that, I thank God for his grace and for his mercy. For throughout this Bible, this Bible is littered with people when everything from the lady issue of blood, 12 years, spent all she had, went to physicians, everything done, and then she come to Jesus. If I were Jesus, I would say, no. No. I may call you a long time. I'm calling you a long time, and you're not coming. And now that you're the end of your rope, you're coming to me. <clears throat> Go back home. But not Jesus. I am overwhelmed with gratitude as I see as I flick the pages that when people are at the bottom of the end of the road at the bottom of the pit they look up to Jesus and in his love and mercy he touches them and helps them I'm, I'm greatly encouraged by that because truly like the prodigal son some persons are never going to come to God until they hit the pig pen amen I might get the amen, but if I, if I were to begin to call out people this morning, what brought you to the Lord? The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws a man to repentance. But how many of us were drawn to God by his goodness? Or was it a pig pen experience that, no, no, keep your hands down, keep your hands down. You know, hitting rock bottom that caused many of us to look up to God. And there's a beauty at the bottom many times that when we hit rock bottom, the only place for us to look is up. And I look at this, Jeroboam, a king, a man of God. We're going to see a little bit, a man in a king's position, had an experience with God. Um, I'm a, I am a bit puzzled that many times we try everything else and when everything else and everyone else fails us, then is when we turn to God. I think that we are to turn to God first. I encourage people here, even the congregants, the great congregation we have here, sometimes before you call me, call God. Kneel down, look up to God and talk to him first. Sometimes we, we spend so much time on the telephone telling people uh, the problems we have that can't even help us. Sometimes as, as soon as we finish telling them, they, they hang up and call and tell somebody else our problems. What a friend we have in Jesus. I want to challenge you to build a relationship with him. He's an he's a ever-present help in a time of need. But strangely, Jeroboam, instead of, I would have hoped to have seen reading this text that Jeroboam, much like David or other great kings, would begin to seek. God for the life of his child. Even David, through his uh, adulterous affair with Bathsheba, when that child was sick unto death, 
David put on sackcloth and ashes and mourned before God and seek God to have mercy with his child. We don't see Jeroboam doing that. Jeroboam says to his wife, you go and check the man of God for me. Second-hand information, middleman, you know, you go, pastor, I don't really want to get so close to God. You go and come and tell me what God is saying to me. Hmm? It's like um, when the, the wise men, don't know how wise they were, the Bible called them wise, they went seeking Jesus, went to Herod, look, went to the palace looking for the king. Um, kings are in palaces, right? That's how it works. Not so much with God because the king was in the stable and the criminal was in the palace. Different message. But they went to the palace looking for the king. Met the wicked Herod and told Herod they, they came to look for the king that was born. And Herod said to them, you go and when you go and find him, come send and call me. Let me tell you, each one of us have to seek God for ourselves. You can't send nobody to seek God. Pastor, go and seek God and bring a nice sermon for me on Sunday. Hmm? I like it. Delivery service. Free shipping. Go and seek God and come back and tell me what God is saying. Hmm? And Jeroboam, the man, the king, said to his wife, you go. Disguise yourself. Go to the man of God and he will tell us what, will, what is the outcome of this situation. I believe with the sick child, the uncertainty, perhaps he would show signs of getting better and then he would relapse and they're just dear. I, I don't know how long, perhaps months, perhaps years, and the child is sick and he just, there's no surety in his mind. And he says, Wife, disguise yourself, go down and um, check with the man of God and find out from him what is the outcome of this situation. I want to try the men now. Men are supposed to be men now. That's like husband and wife lying down and noise in the yard and the husband says, Honey, go outside and see what that is, please. <laughs> Next day, the, the, divi the divorce papers are going to be <laughs> lodged because men are supposed to lead. Right? And lady said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but... I am just disappointed in Jeroboam's response in that Jeroboam didn't go himself. He, he, he rather sent his wife to do his dirty work. And we see in the Bible many stories where husband and wife, you know, we, I, I don't see Jeroboam's wife saying, let's seek God, let's fast, let, let, let's go down on our knees, let's believe God for our child. The, the Bible doesn't bear it out. But Jeroboam, under pressure, devises a scheme. Wife, you go. Disguise yourself. Go down and find out what the outcome is going to be. Jeroboam said in verse 3, Take ten loaves and cracknels. Cracknels, from what I studied, is a savory biscuit. And take a cruise, a big jug of honey, and go unto him. And he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And by you know God can't be bribed. Hmm? You know that? We are so fun we are so accustomed that and I've heard many people say, every man have his price. Ever heard that? Hmm? Given the right stimulus, every man will give in to something or the other. Right? So this king, I believe, accustomed to buying whatever he wanted. Okay, what's the price? I'll pay it. Wielding power, said, just go down and check the man of God. Give him ten loaves, some biscuits, some crews of honey. You know, just sweeten the pot for him. And bingo, and tell him, give us a response. I thought about this throughout the Bible, thinking about Elisha when the Syrian general went down and dipped. After, reluctantly, he dipped. I want to tell you, church, as Christians, we are to be different. A real Christian, a person who has an experience with God, an experience with God, cannot be bought or sold. I see Elisha there, this big um, Syrian general comes down, covered with leprosy again. You see, we brought him the man of God, sickness. 
And he came to the man of God, and the man of God said, let's go aside and dip in the river seven times. And his pump and his pride, he said, look, there are better rivers in Syria. And, and, and the Bible says that Elisha didn't even go to meet him. Can you imagine the big general, five-star, coming to the entourage, and, and the servant boy says, hey, you know, the prime minister outside, tell him, I say, go, on, go and dip down a judge bay and come back. Right? And he was enraged. The man of God was not taken back by his, his, his stature because the man of God knew that no matter how great we are, we're just men. Breathe the same air, have the same end in a little back somewhere. Hmm? And he was not taken back by his great, I pray to God that God help us to understand that no matter we give honor unto whom honor is due, but God says that he's no respecter of person. No matter what a man has, he's still a man. And the greatest among men is still just men. And here it is that Elisha said, tell him, go and dip down Judge Bay and come back. And he objected, he cursed, but then a little servant said, why not? We, we, we already traveled here so far. Why not just do it? And he went and he dipped. I can imagine the humility, the steam in the water, vex, a bubble up the water going down, dipping. Six times, no change. He said, boy, if me go on this seven times, I'll come up, boy, Elisha did. Hmm? Thank be unto God, he went down and came back up and his skin was smooth as a baby, the Bible said. And he went and he said, hey, Elijah, hear the garments. Here's my gratitude. And Elijah said, give praise unto God. Take your garments with you. Go ahead. It's not unique in a world now where all pastors, pastors love money. Hmm? Not all of us. Some of us can't be bought and sold. And Elijah said, no, go ahead. I'm reminded of... Abraham, when he recovered his nephew Lot from the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah in their preacher said, here, take some wealth, take some... He said, no, 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 you keep what's yours. Lest when God bless me, you say that you made me rich. Men of God refusing money. What a rarity in 2014. Hmm? Take your money and go, I don't want it. New Testament in Acts 18 Eight, Acts 8 and verse 18, I just put this, jot this one down. There was a, a sorcerer named Simeon, and he, when he saw, let's just turn it quickly, Acts 8, verse 18. And when Simeon saw that through, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that whosoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast taught that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Can you imagine the arrogance of Jeroboam? Carry on like an offering, give him some bread and some crackers and some honey, and tell him, give us a response. Real people of God can't be bought and sold. So every person you hear on the radio and television say, call in and get your enemy's names just for. Fifteen dollars a minute. Hmm? The psychic line that tell you, hmm. Open a machine, nobody can this morning. Hmm? You better come to church. Hmm? She calls God gifted psychic for big money. Real men and women of God can't be bought or sold. But in his mind, Jeroboam taught that the church and God function just like the world. Higher, just call a high enough figure and they with buckle. And I want to challenge the church as God's people. We are not to be bought or to be sold. And he sent her down with, with some offering and said to her, go ahead. Go and find out from this church. I believe that when real pressure hit people, people know who to turn to. You don't believe that Jeroboam had hold on the people in his entourage that hold on a supposed wise men to turn to. I'm saying that from my experience, many times people laugh and ridicule and this little prophet down there, this little church, and they giggle and smirk. But when real problems hit you, my wife can be a witness. Sometimes half 11 in the night, sometimes a phone ring all hours. I'm surprised at some of the people that call. Because when real problem hit, they want real help. 
and that little um, religion that they practice sometimes on a Sunday morning. When real problem hit, pe people want real help. And in this situation, Jeroboam did, you know, cause I, and I believe they tried. I believe they tried, but they just could not get the job done. So he went to seek for real help. And I want to challenge you too, church, when, when problems, not if problems, when problems hit you, be careful who you seek counsel from. You'll go to some people with one problem and leave from there with four. They will dig you, the advice that they will give you. Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And there are many people who walk daily in the ungodly advice. I know of people that have gone to people for marital counseling, get some ungodly advice. Marriage mash up and the same person they go to for advice end up and marry their, their farmer spouse. Yes? You hear me? Be careful to whom you, hmm, you seek advice. And uh, word of wisdom too. If I am going to if I am going to come to you for counsel about swimming, I would like to know that you can swim. You know what I mean? If, if, if I'm going to come to you about advice about life, I would like to see your life in somewhat of an order. Hmm? I'm coming to you with marital advice. I, I would hope that you're married and happily married. Hmm? Sometimes it saddens me, even as Christian people, Go to unsaved people for godly advice. Let me balance that. I'm saying, if I want my car fixed, I go to the mechanic. It doesn't matter if he's Christian, yes or no, he can fix my car. Right? He's a mechanic. Carpenter, financial information, travel. But then, when I want godly advice, how can I go to somebody that the Bible calls ungodly? Hmm? You're going to the baker asking the baker, about a wiring problem you have home. Hmm? Morning, birds feel brownie. Um, the toilet not flushing and the water back in. The man said, pardon, it's a baker shop. I think you're, you're asking for the wrong, yeah, the wrong place, the plumbing, the plumbing shop. And sometimes godly people go to, God, Christians go to ungodly people and asking them. Sometimes ungodly people giving Christians godly. It, you don't have to go to church all the time now. It's not, it's not all of that now. It's your heart. And good Christian people say, oh, true, yes. Mm. I want to just be careful. I, I, I want to be careful this morning to warn you to be very careful who you are allowing to speak counsel into your life, especially when it comes to matters of, of gravity. So we pick up the story now. Um, I don't like the fact that he sent his wife. I thought he should have gone. I don't like the fact even where, with the disguise and deception, dress up yourself and go. Perhaps, I don't know if, like Nicodemus, you know, pride, pride and pump is a terrible thing. You know, Nicodemus wanted Jesus, but he wouldn't go to Jesus but by night. I don't want to buy his, no, that me go to like a church there. Mm. I will listen on the radio, but I'm not going. What would my mother say? Hmm? She went by night. And the king of this great nation said, um, the man of buy you know you go. Dress up simple, change your clothes. And I want to buy you know that a sideway church you go in to get help. Hmm? Just not us now, them, them. Don't get so sick, breathe. <sighs> right? Not you, it's them. And he decided to go in disguise. Right? And he dressed up and sent her. Be careful how people send you out to do things to the church. As you all know, I do a prison ministry. I go to prison regular and I'll tell you, boy, some people up there because people send them out. And as a wife, she said, well, my husband, my child's sick, she's desperate, and she just went and did anything. She grabbed the oil, she grabbed the bread, she loved her child, and she just walking down the road in disguise. And the story picks up as I wrap up in verse 4. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see 
for his eyes were set by reason of his age. The prophet, the man of God, the Bible says he was old. And just by virtue of his age, his eyes were dimming. Anybody know that we're getting older? I know you don't feel any older. I still feel like I'm about 40, you know. That's how I feel, but the calendar, you know, tells me something a bit different. You know, but, <laughs> but by reason of age, the Bible says his eyes became dim. You never seen, even in Jesus, I laugh, some big old man, 60s, 70s, walking around, boxer shorts, showing ten latest tennis shoes, latest cell phone, bopping, like, psst, baby. Sometimes I say, boy, if you say psst, it dentures my drop out. Right? But, and I want to say, partner, by reason of age, you know, probably pants, no man. You know, understand you're getting older. And, it, and it, the different sermon in there will understand <laughs> your age. But the Bible said that the man of God, just by virtue of age, had lost his eyesight. He could not see. In verse 5, even though he was blind, the Bible says, and the Lord said unto Ahijah, behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing for her son, for he is sick and thus and thus shall thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. How tragic is it to try to fool God? Hmm? How wise is it to try to fool God? He in his bedchamber have this scheme to go down and con the man of God. But he forgot that he was a man of God. Hmm? You ever see people catch, uh, again, nobody in here. You ever see people catch plane and go St. Martin, go sin. Go Puerto Rico, go sin, a rendezvous. Because God has a visa for go Puerto Rico. So they sin in Puerto Rico, not, not in Antigua, because you know, God has a visa. Hmm? And this king, this device is like a scheme to con God. Again, not you. <laughs> to con God. And even though this man was blind, and I, I keep challenging your church, take God serious. Grow to be a man or woman of God, that God can speak to you. One of my daily prayers is wisdom and discernment. Because people are tricky, and people come to you in disguise. But if you have your ear cocked to God, God will speak a word to you. And God spoke to the man of God. Though he was blind in the natural, he could hear God's voice. And God said to you, the wife is coming. She's going to ask you this and this. And when she comes, she's going to pretend to be somebody else. I want to tell you now, when you come to God, my simple advice, you know, just complain. Just complain, you know. You know, people dress up and... I, w I would encourage you, when you come to God... Take off the disguise and just come clean because he knows. You might fool me. Maybe I'm not at this point yet where this man of God can, or I can hear God clear and then I'm pushing to, be, to get close to God myself to hear. But even if you slip one by me, I want to tell you that, that, that there has never existed a human being that has caught God off guard or pulled the fast one on God. Though we come many times to church, to men of God, with our disguise on, I want to challenge you, if you really, really want help with God, just come clean because he already knows. I laugh sometimes when people pray, oh, oh almighty, excellent heaven of uh, God of the heaven and the earth, um, uh, Jehovah, Jehovah, and go, uh, go through all this long, stretched out, but you say, God, my becks now, come and last my job. And I thought you were supposed to be my provider. I mean, you can come to God playing. You ever get tired of fake people? You ever get fired? Of, you ever get tired of fake people? That every time they come to you, they come to you with a disguise on. You have hours, but they never complain. I go to prison and what do you, well, somebody, and I grew, I say, partner, just complain, no? I say, what are you here for? Kleptomania. 
You know, I'm not, I said, Klepto, what? Klepto, I'm larceny. I said, larceny? Oh, you like check up people's up, man. Okay, all right. But I said, come, come to me plain, man. They carry me all around Willie Key to, just to bring me back to St. John's. You like check up people's up, man. I can pray for you, Lord, help me to stop check up people's up. Well, I need to have a counseling session with you and uh, hours and hours. Well, I'm like, people say, so, oh. when you complain, I want to remind you that though men only hear the words of our mouth, David said, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Because David was quite aware, though people can't hear what we think, God's radio is tuned into not only our voice, but the frequency of our heart. That means when you smile and say, hi girl, I love you. And in your heart you say, me I love you, tall, tall. Need, need I remind you this morning about the little girl, true story in church, that walked up to a lady and said, my mother said you had too much shoes. True story. Be careful what you say in the dark, because it will come to light. Hmm? Moving on. <laughs> they tried to pull a fast one on God. Church, how foolish is that? I want to challenge you. It don't make no sense. Come to church. Pretend. Live one life here. Raise your hand. Sing glory, hallelujah. And go out there and live like the devil. You're only fooling yourself. Because you're not fooling God. Sometimes you're not even fooling the man of God. And I'll be honest with you this morning. Though I have heard God, I have heard heard God's voice speak to me, sometimes because Antigua is 108 square miles, I don't even need to hear God's voice, because somebody don't tell me, Antigua is so little. You come to church and pretend and go, and I already know where you were last night, because somebody take a picture and post on Facebook. Hmm? I saw you in carnival last week, because somebody tagged you. Sometimes people forget who and who are them are friends on Facebook now, because some of the things they post, they say, they, they, they can't know me and them a friend and post this. But they forget. They have so much friends. Mm? And they get sold out so simple. Mm? They pretend don't make no sense, church. If you're going to come to God, my little advice this morning, take off the disguise and just come clean because God already knows. A broken and a contrite spirit, God said he would know Wise, refuse. And God gave him a heads up. God told, her, told him she was going to pretend. She's going to come. What's her motive? Oh, I need God to help me to show me people's motives. Show me why it is they're coming, Lord. Why? Show me the motives of people's heart. God said to him, this is why she's coming. I want to tell you, you can't see people's motives now. People come to church to make certain social connections. People come around to get... What, a, what comfort there is in resting in God that God knows people's motives. Why she was coming to the man of God. And verse 6 said, And it was so that when Anijah heard the sound of her feet, use the imagination with me, as she came in at the door, he said, Come in, the wife of Jeroboam. Mm. Now, I want to warn you that her disguise was such that she was a public figure and she fooled everybody else coming down. She couldn't fool the man of God. Hmm. And she fooled everybody and she said, what? I read so far. I was, I was trying to research to see how much miles she traveled, but I couldn't get information. And she made a distance, got to the door, and she fooled everybody. And as soon as she gets to the door, the blind man said, come on in, Jeroboam's wife. What a wake-up call. Hmm? And I love to see the, the Spirit of God move. And I want some of you here too. I have seen God move supernaturally now and, and reveal some things that some people did and have done. And it blows my mind that God sees everything. And she walks up and I would, lo I would have paid money to see the look on her face to hear the blind man tell her, come on down, Jeroboam's wife. Hmm? Oh, how we need the Spirit of God again to move in his church. That the fear of God can come back in the church. One guy I interviewed on my radio program said he remembered the days where he would where he'd be afraid to go to church. 
Because some old mother, some old sister, when they walk in, would look at you and say, we saw what you did last night, where you did it, who you did it with, and what you had on. That's the power of Almighty God. And people were scared. He said to me, when he sinned, he afraid to go to church. Hmm? Because somebody there moving by the Spirit of God. How empty our churches would be. Hmm? If the Spirit of God, how, but the people would be afraid again to enter into God's house knowing that they're living a sinful life and not repenting. I say, Lord, let it be. And she came to the door, buzz, buzz, buzz. And he said to her, um, verse 6, Come in, the wife of Jeroboam. And he said to her, Why finish thou thyself to be another? Why are you coming to God's house on the false pretense? Why are you coming to God's house? Why are you coming for godly help? On the false pretense. I love nothing better sometimes, church, when somebody calls me and says, I need help in a particular area. Here's what I'm going through. Because many times people treat you like a spiritual MacGyver or a spiritual Sherlock Holmes. If you're good, tell me what's wrong with me. Let me see how good you are. Tell me my problem. Have you ever seen doctors from Mount St. John's walking around town trying to diagnose people if they're sick? Or, or, or do the sick people? You ever see an ad promoting a hospital anywhere in the paper and the radio? Okay, see, when people are sick, they find the hospital. But sometimes we want the hospital to find us. Tell me what's wrong with me. And Jeroboam said to her, Come in. What? And he asked her a, a powerful question Why are you pretending to be somebody else that you're not? That you're not? That's a whole sermon by itself. Why are you pretending to be somebody else that you're not? And he said to her, I am sent to thee with these heavy tidings. Anyone that, that, that aspires to be a man or a woman or God, I want to tell you that our mission and mandate to declare God's word many times can be heavy. And Jeroboam said to her, sit down. I have some heavy tidings to tell you. She went there for a diagnosis of her son. Hear the words of the prophet. As God said it to him, he declared it. He didn't water it down. He did not fear her response. She, was, she had money. She had power. They could have snapped their finger and had him killed. He said, I have something heavy to tell you and I'm going to declare it. And He says in verse 7, Go tell Jeroboam. Let me interject here that it's amazing how we can have step one step. Go, give him the things, get the answer, come back. Go, give him the things, get the answer, come back. You see how, how we can have everything work out in our mind, how it's going to go. And how God can just interrupt our great plan. She going on the road, go, give him the stuff, get the answer, go home. Go, and, and as soon as she reach, cherubim wife, sit down, you pretend. Hear what God has to say to you. I want to tell you that God can mess up your plan so easy. Go meet a nice girl, married, um, big house, big job. But just, just be careful when you plan your life. You know, you leave some room for God. Because things can change so quickly. Sickness, disease, economy, so many variables. And verse 7, he says, go tell Jeroboam. Remember, she came for a diagnosis for her son. But hear how God diagnosed the real sickness situation. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I have exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel. God said to Jeroboam, I exalted you. I made you what you are. I gave you your mind. I gave... People, I want to challenge you. Whatever you have this morning, God gave it to you. That IQ, that mind, that wit, God gave it to you. You didn't give it. It's amazing. Sometimes God gives us a, a little bit more aptitude, intelligence. We remember things better. And before we say, God, thank you for giving me a good mind. We look down on others who aren't as intelligent as us. Hmm? And here it is that the old blind prophet 
brought things into perspective and said to Jeroboam's wife, he said, go and tell Jeroboam, even though you're here seeking a diagnosis for your son, God has a word for you to give to Jeroboam. Go and tell Jeroboam that I exalted him. I made him. To everyone within his money, God made you and God made me. Whatever position we have, whatever we have we sang this morning, all the glory belongs to God. Everything we have is by God's grace. And somehow Jeroboam, I believe, forgot that. And the prophet said, tell him for me that I exalted him among the people. I made him a prince over my people Israel. And rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in my eyes. But, ha but has done evil above all that were before thee. Can you imagine God said to you that you're the wickedest person so far? Hmm? God said to King Jeroboam that thou hast done evil above all that were before thee. And thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and has cast me behind thy back. You know why I encourage you to come out prayer meeting all the time and pray? Because we can do things and because God doesn't judge right away, we continue in them. We do, we sin, and that's why even as this nation of Antigua and Barbuda, we as God people have to constantly pray. I look around Antigua and every corner I see now is a strip club. Y'all, y'all ever seen them? Hmm? No. Oh, you've seen uh, one person has seen them. Everybody else living in um, Jumbi Bay. I never see, right? Our nation, everything now is fit, fit, fit. We feel I have more fit than carnival. Hmm? Fit, wet, fit, this fit, that fit. All of them glorifying alcohol, sex. I, rum, young little picnic, and when they talk to you now, just about, boy, me go last and me get sparrow, stone. Hmm? And laugh and be, yeah, man, you know, yeah, boy, junk like our. Hmm? And these things anger a holy God. And though the politicians do what they must in whatever quarter, the church needs to constantly pray on behalf of this nation and cry out to God. Because though God may be quiet at times and God gives room to repent, God will always judge. And the prophet said to Jeroboam's wife that he has made other gods, education, sex, money, all other gods, and he has provoked, if I were to ask you this morning, in your calendar, in your priority list, where does God lie? Are there other gods up there making it next piece of land, next zero on the bank account, more education, masters, prominence, prestige, where in your long list of attributes does almighty God truly rest? Hmm? Say, so God, give, give me a printout right now of the priorities of the people before me. And let me check and see how many of them have you as number one. For the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you're seeking for, God will add. And here it is that God, this was an audit. This was the diagnosis that God had for Jeroboam. Therefore, the judgment, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man take it away dung till it be all gone. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat and him that diet in the field shall the fowls of the ear eat for the Lord has spoken it. Arise therefore, get thee to thy own house. And when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. 
And by you can say, what a diagnosis. Hmm? Wow. And this, I didn't put this in the Bible. This is in your Bible too now. If you don't have a Bible here, go home and check. I didn't put this in. God said to Jeroboam's wife, here is the right diagnosis of this situation. Your life, your lifestyle, your idolatry, your gods have provoked me to anger. And God said, I set you up and I can take you down. Anybody believe it's a, it's a smart idea to fear God? Proverbs talk a lot about the fear of God. I even hear people that are called by God's name doing some things. I say, I say wow. I fear God because I know God is a holy God. And God will judge. You know how sometimes we don't touch certain people. You say, oh, how, how is that going to make the family look? How is that going to make the nation look? Anybody you know God, <laughs> God raised him up and God didn't take no shame in bringing him down. And God said to Jeroboam's wife, here is the real diagnosis. You come and concern about your son, but you, Jeroboam, are the real sick person in the nation. Your sickness, though not physical, you are sick spiritually. You are idolatrous, you are wicked, you are ungrateful. And for this, you want to hear what I have to say? You really want to hear what I have to say? I'm going to punish you and judge you. Church, I've, I know from experience to minister and declare God's word, especially in this time and this age, is so challenging where people um, accuse you of... Uh, a, a bigoted and every, a closed-minded and your, your dogmatic religion. But I, I, I am challenged as I encourage people, as I encourage you this morning, church, it's better to get the truth here where you have time to correct it than to find after this life, as the Bible declares, is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment, to stand before Almighty God and at that point, when it's too late and nothing can be done, God hand down a true picture of who we really are. At that point, there's no restart. At that point, there's only judgment. And Jeroboam's wife got the, her judgment passed down to her and to them as a family. And each one of us, church, every one of us in this room, each one of us has an appointment, just like Jeroboam's wife, where God is going to weigh our hearts. The bad mind, the envy, the gossip, the slander, the lies, the cheating, fornication, the adultery, all the hidden things of our heart that we disguise that nobody knows about. When, when we stand before God, the secret things of our heart are going to be exposed. And that's why God in this time gives us a chance to repent here. That though our sins be as red as scarlet, if we repent and turn from them now, God offers forgiveness here and now. I want to challenge the church. It's a very sobering <laughs> scripture. Because anybody agree with me that this isn't what Jer Jeroboam's wife expected? Would you agree with me that this is not exactly what she had in mind when she left her house the morning? Hmm? To stand before the, the words of a displeased God. But how many people leave their house every morning? See you later. Go out, car accident, accident, this, that, food, all kind of things. Leave the house the morning and find themselves standing before a God and hearing some things they didn't expect to hear. Hmm? Good people, good by the standard of, well, I'm in church, I'm on the committee, I sing, I do all that. And Jesus said, I never knew you. Like, like Nicodemus, you must be born again. You, you tell some people, you need to get saved. 
I'm not drowning. Hmm? I'm not lost. You can spurn and mock in the words of my deceased pastor. You can do what you want, but not for as long as you want. There comes a point where we're going to all have to give an account to a holy God. And this guy might even fool me, fool people around you. But the God that will judge us sees true and true us. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Preach a sermon on that. But this morning, I'm going to ask you to remember Jeroboam's wife. I want to challenge you, church, this morning to do a very serious introspection. Look at your life. Are you ready to stand before a holy God?